Good evening. Good to see all of you. Welcome. And welcome to all of you who are streaming on YouTube and Facebook. And that's my reminder, John, to be on good behavior because the World Wide Web is watching you and me right now, so uh, careful. Uh, but that also means if you want to go back and watch it again, you can. It will be um, archived on both of those sites. Today is the feast of Richard of Chichester, who died in 1253. You know some of his works by the hymn, Day by Day, that line, Dear Lord of Thee, three things I pray, to see Thee more clearly, love Thee more dearly, follow Thee more nearly. Those are the words of St. Richard uh, nearly 800 years ago. Let us pray. We thank Thee, Lord God, for all the benefits Thou hast given us in Thy Son, Jesus Christ, our most merciful Redeemer, friend, and brother, and for all the pains and insults He hath borne for us. And we pray that following the example of Thy saintly Bishop, Richard of Chichester, we may see Christ more clearly, love Him more dearly, and follow Him more nearly who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So this is the second of the June lectures. We'll have them in July. We'll have two or three in July. The topics I haven't quite settled on yet. I'm leaving for a week tomorrow, but when I return, uh, pay attention to the communications, and hopefully we'll find something that is edifying, interesting and maybe even entertaining um, topics that will, that will help us connect with our faith, with the gospel, and to think theologically. And tonight's topic is one that I'm actually interested in, not because I am a big follower of UFOs or UAPs or things of that nature, but because the government is actually admitting they don't know something, which is extraordinary, and that when you see these compelling naval videos, uh, videos from naval aviators, who are seeing these extraordinary things move around, and you can hear the genuine surprise and shock in their voice, having no idea what this is, um, that grabs one's attention, it grabs my attention. And so what I'm interested in is let's just pretend, because we, we all know that from the, um, I think it was the CARES Act or something last year, part of that legislation was that in this month there would be a report to Congress letting them know what these things are if we in fact know them. And that is a shocking thing as well, that for the longest time the government wasn't admitting these things even exist. Now they're saying, they do happen, and not only that, we don't know what they are. That's fascinating. Now, what really grabbed my attention for tonight is something that former President Barack Obama said in a New York Times podcast on June 1st. Now, I think we all know this is a reasonable thought. It would make sense to me um, that presidents may have a book of secrets. It just seems natural. If you go into an office, they give you a binder with the email passwords or the copier passwords. There's got to be a presidential version of passwords or secrets or things that we don't know about that they know about, right? Maybe the best item on the menu in the White House. And oh, by the way, here's what's actually at Area 51. And so I just assume that they all collectively know a lot of stuff, which may be why after they finish office, they all seem to get along pretty well for the most part. Maybe they have some common knowledge that has bound them together that only four or five of them know, and like, boys, we gotta stick together on this. So in June 1st, New York Times, this is what former President Barack Obama said when he was asked what would happen if it were demonstrated that all of the UAP, which I think is unidentified aerial phenomenons, which sounds less conspiratorial than UFO. What if it was demonstrated that these things that the naval aviators and airline pilots, et cetera, are seeing are actually drones 
sent from alien civilizations. Now, he said lots of things in there, but among them he offered this. This is a quote. And new religions would pop up, and who knows what kind of arguments we'd get into. End quote. The part that fascinates me is that President Obama speculates that if we can demonstrate that these objects are from another civilization, not of this earth, new religions would pop up. Now, um, I think I know what he meant. New religions pop up all the time, not because of new divine revelation, but because we've grown tired of the demands and implications of the old revelation. When we're tired of what we believe to be revealed from God, when it's not suiting our needs anymore, or our lifestyle or whatever, we like to find something else that's more suitable to us, to kind of create our own little theology, our own religion. So I don't think that President Obama necessarily has inside information of an alien species living on this planet. I don't really think that the largest government agency and the largest funded agency is something like Men in Black, because I just don't trust human beings to keep that kind of secret. That would be impressive. Um, but I do think he raises, perhaps unintentionally, an interesting question. If it were demonstrated that alien life forms have visited and do visit this planet, would that change the Christian proclamation? I think what President Obama was getting at is that if you have something new that's come up, people will get into a frenzy about it and create some new philosophy. They'll make a god out of it, you know, and try to manipulate it. But if it is demonstrated we are not alone, how, if at all, does that change, alter our faith in God, our faith in Jesus Christ, who is the Redeemer of the world. To put a fine point on it, if the gospel within the gospel, the heart of the gospel, we might argue is John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, what does that mean if we discover there are other life forms on other worlds? Now again, it may seem like a science fiction Bible study, but the government is going to address it this month. And so it's worth us to at least do the thought experiment. What if this is true? What does it mean for us? So I think this is important for two reasons. Um, one, pure mathematical probability makes it almost certain that there are life forms, not only in this galaxy, but throughout the universe. Because the universe is so mind-boggling vast that it would be almost, in terms of probability, impossible for life and rational life to not exist. So what do I mean by rational life? So when my 16-year-old heard that I was going to do this, she and I had different immediate thoughts about extraterrestrial life. She was thinking about microorganisms on Mars. I am thinking about Mork from Ork, right? Which is a reference only some of us will get, I understand. I don't think anyone denies the fact that there are microorganisms, if there are polar ice caps in Mars and other places and, and the moons of Jupiter, yes, there's molecules, there's probably microorganisms, sure, life forms at a basic level. I'm talking about a Cartesian definition of people who have self-awareness. They can think rationally. There is an intelligence. I'm talking about creatures that, if, if they're not they don't look like us, share some of those same qualities of self-awareness and, and sentient thought. So that being said, the fact that mathematicians will tell us that in terms of probability, it's almost guaranteed there's something out there. There is something called the Fermi paradox, which raises this interesting conundrum. Even though it's mathematically almost certain there's something out there, there is absolutely zero evidence 
It exists. And that's the paradox. If it is so overwhelmingly probable, why is there no evidence? Interesting question. Because not only are governments watching the sky, but amateur astronomers are watching the sky with their own, who hasn't had a telescope, you know, in their backyard at some point in their life to watch the moon and to look around? All of our eyes are gazed up. What have we discovered? And not only now, but in centuries before, um, I think it's fair to say that the ancients were far better amateur astronomers than we will ever be. We pay attention to the night sky when there's a super duper blood harvest Dracula moon in the sky, and you know, it's on the news, or I get a text message every time the International Space Station flies over my house, and I grab the boys and we go watch the thing go across the sky, but I'm not staring at the night sky with no ambient light, night after night, pondering existence beyond myself, but those who went before us certainly did. Hence the constellations, hence the stories, all the things that came with that. And despite all of that, is there a single record of a credible extraterrestrial encounter? No. So all of this is just interesting, interesting stuff that bring up interesting theological questions. If there is someone out there, what does that mean about our faith? If there is no one in this vast universe what does that mean for our faith? Now let me go ahead and cut to the chase. We're not going to answer these questions with any great satisfaction. My aim is to prime the pump so we can actually think about these things. Because what I want to demonstrate is that there have been interesting thoughts throughout the history of the church, not because they were thinking about Mork from Orc or some other um, alien life form visiting this planet, but they were thinking about God and contemplating the power of God. And then some of these fundamental questions that when, we, when you boil it down, we're asking, they've already had some thoughts about them. And so as we deal with what the government may or may not reveal this month, there is a theological, biblical foundation on which we can build and stand to think about this with confidence and not anxiety. What does this mean for our faith, if anything at all? Now for me, the greatest, this is me, the greatest theological question raised by the possibility of extraterrestrials is this. How cosmic was the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ? To answer that question, we have to ask another one that is like unto it. How cosmic was the sin of Adam? Here's what I mean when I ask, how cosmic was the sin of Adam? The fall of humanity, which introduced this universal bent towards sin, our universal inclination to always seek what harms ourselves and others. Even if our intentions are good, we always end up falling off the right path into something that is destructive. When that event happened and the, our nature was altered into this fallen reality, did that ripple throughout the entire created universe? Or was that something that is confined to this mortal coil here? And then that is what leads to the next question. When Jesus Christ died on the cross and the third day the tomb was empty, did that ripple throughout the cosmos? Or is that an act, an event, a salvific reality that only applies to human beings living on this planet? It may sound silly, but if you think about it, I think these are the two, for me at least, the two most important of all the questions. So where do we even begin for the answers? I mean, there is no book in the Bible, you know, called Second Aliens or anything like that where you can turn to and, and find the answers. Now, obviously, the, the title of this lecture is called What Did Ezekiel See? 
as the prophet Ezekiel is one of the most vivid and strange books in all the biblical canon, a fascinating book which is confusing at every single line. There are strange creatures, strange activities, and strange forces of nature that are all around. So let me read, um, beginning with the fourth verse of the first chapter of Ezekiel. Now, you know I'm reading from a, I'm a, from a biblical book. You know that already that the context of this book is God, the revelation of God, uh, the power of God. So you, because of our bias of where we are and why you're here and who you are, we're already going to see the power of God and a heavenly vista in what I'm about to read. But try to read it from a neutral lens and see kind of what this may sound like to you. This is Ezekiel talking. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness round about it, and fire flashing forth continually, and in the midst of the fire, as it were gleaming bronze, and from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the form of men, but each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like burnished bronze. And then it goes on. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read this, I have a combination of close encounters of the third kind and cocoon with the burnished bronze. You know, I see Wilford Brimley running around in his birthday suit, right? You can see in, in reading this text, you can see how someone looking back might wonder, in the biblical narrative, is there any sort of evidence of this? And starting from our images that we have, thanks to Steven Spielberg and others, we can look back and say, now wait a minute, wait a minute. This seems like Ezekiel was living in the desert of Nevada, perhaps. And something may have happened. He may, he may have seen something. Now, this fantasy is, uh, as a fantasy of ours, I think that we can look back into the past and see visits from maybe the future. An example of how this fantasy plays out, this is something that I just discovered recently. And I'm really embarrassed to say I just discovered this because I think all of you probably already know this if you're a movie fan. But in the movie uh, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, when Indiana Jones and his Egyptian colleague are raising the stone slab of the ark, and you see all the hieroglyphs that are around, what is, in, what is on one of the pillars? You seen what's on one of the pillars? Am I not the last person to discover this? Go and watch Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark, and when they're raising the ark out of the, out of the stone um, sarcophagus, whatever, on one of the pillars, like looking one of these, and you have all these Egyptian hieroglyphics, there is R2-D2 and C-3PO etched on the pillar. It's there. You have to pause it at the right time. Because George Lucas wrote the story of both, and it's a wonderful little Easter egg to see it in there. But the point is, there's kind of a fantasy that you can look back in the past and see something of alien civilizations kind of coming in. It's the, sort, it's the stuff of great science fiction and great science fiction movies. But is the same thing happening in Ezekiel? Well, no, it's not. That's the problem of reading only 20 verses and not 20 chapters and not reading 20 books because you've got to get the greater context. But what does, if anything, does the Bible say about the world beyond the earth? It actually says a little bit, not much. Anyone own a Subaru? You own a Subaru. You know the symbol on the back of your car. It's of six stars. And it represents the five Japanese automakers that came together into one. Do you know what Subaru is Japanese for? Pleiades. So it represents the star cluster that is um, bright in the night sky. So Subaru is Japanese for Pleiades. And you'll see this in the book of Amos, where 
the prophet says, he who made the Pleiades and Orion and turns deep darkness into morning and darkness the day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and, 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 and orders them out of the, upon the surface, the Lord is his name. The point is, in the biblical text, there is an acknowledgement, an awareness of the heavens and the stars and even knowledge and contemplation as to their names, the stories behind them. There is a curiosity of the heavens above. There's also this beautiful text, one of my favorite, from Paul's letter to the Colossians concerning Jesus Christ. This is in the first chapter. And concerning Jesus, St. Paul says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. It's a beautiful text. It says that all of creation is through the Son of God, through Jesus Christ, but it ultimately lands vague and unsatisfying when it comes to our question about life forms, other planets, aliens. And it lands vague and unsatisfying for a good reason. Because the biblical text is the record of God's revelation to humankind, and it concerns our relationship to Him. That's what the point of the biblical text is, and not about life on other planets. In a perhaps similar way is that you know, St. Joseph, and he's, he's on, the, on the right panel in the back, and that kind of demonstrates St. Joseph, right? He's always in the back of the Gospels. Just because St. Joseph is absent after our Lord turns 12, and we see him mainly in Matthew's Gospel, doesn't mean he's not important. It doesn't mean he wasn't uh, the protector and, and raised Jesus and protected Mary and did all these wonderful things. But the point of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John is not about Joseph. The point of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is about Jesus Christ, the boy that he helped raise into a man. And so the point of Genesis to Revelation is about our relationship with God. It's about His revelation and not about life beyond. And that's why it's always going to be, um, it's going to be lacking in terms of the satisfaction. When you're, when you're reading a manual on, on, on CPR, you're not going to l be told how to make chicken salad. Because the point of CPR is resuscitation, not how to make something in the kitchen. So we can't look for something that's unrelated um, in the biblical text um, and then say, well, therefore it doesn't exist because it's not in the Bible. That's nonsense. It's absolutely nonsense. The Bible is a text of revelation and not the encyclopedia divinity recording everything that could possibly exist in the realm of God's goodness and creation. Does that make sense? So just because it's not there says nothing, pro or con, it just simply means the Bible is about us, for us and for our salvation, as the creed reminds us. But the best, I think, quote to keep in mind and to keep us on track comes from the 16th century cardinal uh, Caesar Baronius. And if you've come to Bible studies over the years, you've heard me use this quote before. Caesar Baronius famously said in the context of the controversy surrounding Galileo, he says, the Bible tells us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. The point of the Bible is not to be a scientific textbook. The point of the Bible is to tell us how to find our ultimate end in God. And that, friends, is why the, the manufactured tension between science and faith is just that manufactured. There is no tension between science and faith. Because if you look at the Bible to try to find your chemistry and your physics and your biology, you're looking in, you're looking for in all the wrong places. The Bible itself does not intend to be your, your earth science 
or your chemistry textbook. It's like I said last week when I mentioned how the creation story is clearly out of logical order. It's not because our forefathers in the faith were ignorant as to how plants grow. It's because the ordering of creation mirrored the layout of the temple. It was making a theological statement, not a geological statement. And we have to remember of what the point of the biblical text is, to tell us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. So biblically and theologically speaking, the fact that there is no mention of other worlds in the Bible says nothing about the relationship of God to those worlds. So if the Bible is quiet on the church, I mean, if the, if the Bible is quiet on the subject, what has the church said, if anything? The church has actually thought about this, but they've thought about it in a roundabout way. Now, the most direct medieval attempt to think about life on other planets comes from the 15th century. We're talking 1400s, a long time ago. Um, this is from a French philosopher named William Vorlong. The question that he was dealing with was not about UFOs, UAPs, but a more fundamental philosophical theological question. Can God create a universe better than this one? That was the question they were thinking through. And the answer came back that not only can God create something better than this universe, but God can create an infinite number of universes better than this one. So they weren't talking about UFOs, but the question was about God's power. What is God capable of doing? And this led to an, actually an interesting a statement by um, a 14th century theologian named Francis Mayron. So these were a lot of the scholastic debates in Europe about the nature of God, about what God can and cannot do. And sometimes when you, when you read these questions, it seems like people have nothing better to do. But we have to understand that they really wanted to understand to the best of human intellect everything they could about God. And they would spend an awful lot of time debating questions like how many angels can dance on the head of a pen because they were getting into the substance of faith and they didn't want to just make stuff up but faith seeking understanding through the god-given uh, intellect that we all have so here's what francis mayron said see what you think about this he died in 1327 he said that the sun can be in many individual things all at the same time, like the sun in the sky. Let's try to think of concrete examples. The sun can bring light in your backyard and in my backyard all at the same time. The sun can burn someone in Myrtle Beach, and the sun can burn someone in San Francisco at the exact same time. Be in individual places and mean something to individuals um, that, are in, that are different. In fact, Mehran said, if you have that power and you don't exercise it or act on it, it would be a waste. You see where he's going on this. If God can, of his power, create not only a better universe than this one, but an infinite number of universes, if that's in his power and does not, that's a waste of power. Maybe this is not the best analogy to kind of make the point I'm trying to make, but in the midst of a midlife crisis and a global pandemic, I bought a Chevrolet Camaro last March, and I was nervous to go over 65 miles an hour on 421, and Sherilyn says to me, what is the point of buying a sports car if you're not gonna go fast? That's a good point. What Mehran is getting at is, why have the power to create an infinite number of universes, but you don't? For the record, I'm not suggesting what God has or has not done. I'm just saying it's an interesting argument about the power of God and the possibility of other things that are out there. It's an argument that I think may be worth thinking about. Now let's go back to William Vorlong. He actually addresses the theological questions that follow. If God made not only universes, 
but those universes had inhabited worlds, would they sin like us? Would they need salvation like us? Are you with me so far? Have I lost everybody? We're all together in the same boat. John, you're with me? Okay, good, good. So he's asking, if there are these other universes with inhabited worlds, are they sinful worlds? And if they're sinful worlds, do they need salvation? What do you think his answer is? Because he answers the question. What would you say? If in the Andromeda galaxy, there is a, a planet that is similar to Earth and has, um, if not humanoid creatures, rational creatures that have their own body, blah, 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 would you assume they're sinful or not? Okay, one no and one yes. Why would you say yes? That's a good argument. If God is love and God allows for um, free will, but does that necessarily mean they exercised it toward evil? Maybe. One theologian has said that evil does not exist. There's no reason for evil to exist necessarily. What he's saying is there's no reason why evil has to exist. Now, your argument about free will is a very compelling argument, and that's how we explain why we have bad things happening in this world, because God loves us so much that we have the opportunity to choose Him or not choose Him. Any other alternative would not be an act of love, because our choice has been, has been um, constricted. But in other worlds, evil does not have to exist necessarily, they say. Verlong also says, our fallen nature comes from what person? Adam. So he's saying other worlds would not have fallen creatures necessarily because they do not fall from Adam, or they do not have our sin. That's maybe a better way to put it. They don't share in our sin because they're not descendants of Adam. Now to the question about Christ dying on this earth, um, he says, I answer that he is able to do this even if the worlds were infinite, but would not be fitting for him to go into another world that he must die again. So what Vorolong is saying, and I'm not sure this has been thought through, I've got to think about it more. Remember my two questions? Is the fall of Adam cosmic? Vorolong would say no. Is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ cosmic? He seems to say yes. It would not be fitting for our Lord to go and die again. His one death was sufficient for all. So no one goes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. I think this is the best, most humble way to approach this. No one can go to the Father except through the Son. How that happens and what that looks like in other worlds is God's end of the matter and not ours. That may be the safest thing to say. Both things can be true, is that you have to go through Jesus Christ or go through the Son to get to the Father. What that looks like is God's end of the matter. Our concern is our own faith in this world. We know who Jesus Christ is, and we know what life in Him is like. If there is a fall in nature, these theologians should suggest, God will use His grace to perfect that nature, whatever it is. Our nature was fallen, and so God became man, human, in order to redeem what was fallen. Now, I've saved the most interesting part for toward the end. There's another perspective from a Franciscan friar in the 16th century, Sinistrari of Armino, Amino, who wrote one of the more stranger books I've ever written, and this book has absolutely ruined my Amazon recommendations. He wrote a book on um, demoniality about the incubus and the succubus. If these are new words for you, an incubus is a demon angel who has relations with a female. A succubus is one who has the same, but with males, both usually taking the form of the opposite sex. He wrote a book about it, which is why my Amazon recommendations are completely trashed now. 
he actually explores the nature and activities of the uh, incubus and the, and the succubus in bizarre philosophical detail. But in one of his most interesting arguments, he addresses one of the more bizarre episodes in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 6, the Nephilim. Remember, this is right before the flood, and this is what really um, brings on the flood, where we have these very uh, vague terms, the sons of God have relations with the daughters of men, and from them come giants, the Nephilim, demigods, really, and they ruled the earth. And because of that, and what happened, it's all in the Bible, because of that is what brought about the waters of the flood. Now, Genesis 6 and the Nephilim, there is a lot of interesting things and a lot of interesting background and a lot of interesting possibilities that plug in those holes that aren't appropriate for tonight, um, but they're really interesting, and maybe sometime we can, we can come back to that. But here's what he does. Sinistrari raises a good question. If angels are not corporeal, if they're not bodily, which is what we've always believed, right? If you remember last week when I talked about, for instance, the angels on the triptych, I said they don't have a body, they don't have a color. How do you represent an angel? That's always a tricky thing to do. And whenever you see angels appearing to people, oftentimes you can make the argument they might have been sleeping, it might have been a dream. Certainly Joseph, whenever he encountered an angel, was frequently sleeping. If I were Joseph, I would have rampant insomnia because every time he closed his eyes, some angel came to him and told him to go and move somewhere else. So he raises the question, if they are not corporeal, meaning pure spirit, then how could they be an incubus? How could they impregnate a human being? You follow me here, right? I don't want to get into we're on Facebook and YouTube. You see where I'm going. How is that possible? How could they impregnate a very corporeal activity, the daughters of men? His suggestion is interesting. He says that angels aren't necessarily incorporeal, meaning there may be some corporeality among them. He quotes Thomas Aquinas, who suggested that the, the, the diversity of angels is so great that each angel is its own species. And this is all speculation. These are great prayerful minds trying to work this out and think about it. Would this, with this diversity, or with this diversity, Sinistrani asks, be in degree of corporeality? Basically what he's saying is, like the seraphim and the cherubim who at the throne of God, are they pure spirit, pure intellect? But the lower you get down the, the diversity, is there a certain kind of corporeality that's not the same kind of physicality as we have? He calls it a more subtle body, a more slender body, but still corporeal. And is that the reason why the sons of God, these angelic beings, um, were able to impregnate the daughters of men, and now we have the Nephilim. He also makes the case that the word angel, and he's right about this, simply means messenger. The word angel does not in itself necessarily mean pure spirit and pure intellect. It's really an interesting thought experiment that he goes down, but he takes it even further. He says, okay, let's just say angels who are responsible for the Nephilim, they have a kind of a corporeal nature. So they're in space and time because they're not pure intellect and spirit. Where do they live? That's the next question. Because they don't live here, or we would have seen them apart from Genesis 6. They have to be somewhere as they have a kind of body. So in thinking about these corporeal angels living in other places, he too went down a similar path as Vorolong, who went down later on the questions of sin and redemption. Would they be fallen if they're corporeal? And would they need salvation? Now, I think uh, demoniality is an odd book, right? But his response 
is really one of the better things I've seen on this subject. So despite the subject matter of his book, as he carries his question to its logical conclusion, this is what it sa he says. It's a bit long, but it's worth reading in its entirety. Whether those creatures did or did not sin originally is uncertain. It is clear, however, that if, the, if their first parent had sinned, as Adam sinned, his descent would be born in original sin, as men are born. Basically saying, if their first parent did as our first parent did, then they would have a sinful nature. And as God never leaves a rational creature without a remedy, so long as it treads the way, if those creatures were infected with original or with actual sin, God would have provided them a remedy. But, whatever, what, but whether it is the case and of what kind is the remedy is a secret between God and them. Surely if they had sacraments identical with or different from those in use in the human church militant, for the institution and efficacy thereof, they would be indebted to the merits of Jesus Christ, the Redeemer and universal atoner of all rational creatures. It would likewise be highly probable, nay necessary, that they should live under some law given them by God, and through the observance of which they might merit beatitude. But what would be that law? whether merely natural or written, mosaic or evangelical, or different from all these, and specially instituted by God, that we are ignorant of. Whatever it might be through, there would follow no objection exclusive of the possible existence of such creatures. So he takes what Verlong says, that fallen nature across all rational creatures in the universe or universes is not necessarily a, a given, but the salvation, the universal atonement of Jesus Christ is efficacious for all of creation. But look at what he says. I mean, we always view the Middle Ages and early Renaissance as such a non-thinking, such a dogmatic um, time. He says, whatever course God has chosen to bring about redemption is between God and them. They'd have their own revelation on that. And so there we are, I think, as we travel through what little the Bible says, but these interesting thoughts that we have in, in the church's theology, in the midst of a really, really strange book is the answer to all these questions. What are the implications, theologically, if we discover there is intelligent life here on earth? None other than to confirm the creative power of God. Meaning if someone lands in Central Park in this amazing vehicle and has come from another galaxy, that should not at all threaten the foundations of our faith in Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with it. I think that anxiety is rooted in, the, in maybe the suspicion that we've created this religion to give ourselves some comfort in a world in which we don't understand. And if we find a species that has greater understanding, that might threaten our faith. And maybe we were wrong. And maybe we have made all of this up. If that's the case, we need to work through that anxiety. But in terms of purely thinking it through, there is no reason why any number of species, planets, or universes would have any negative implication on our Christian faith. It would not change our relationship with Jesus Christ. Because again, as the creed says, Jesus Christ was made incarnate, was sent for us men, humans, and our salvation. The fall of humanity seems to be confined to humanity. That answers the first question. Is the fall cosmic? Not in the sense, necessarily, we don't know, but thinking it through, not in the sense that it necessarily, meaning it has to involve every intelligent being. But is the redemptive death of Jesus Christ cosmic? I would answer in the spirit of Varlong and, and, um, and our wonderful friend writing about the angels with their, with their ways, yes. The redemptive act of Jesus Christ is cosmic. The Word of God made all things 
and all things exist in him. The really interesting question, and the one that we can't answer, is what does the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ look like on another world? Okay, I don't have any answers. I have lots of questions, but I'm happy to help guide your questions to something, you know, to a, maybe a, a better question. Any thoughts, comments on any of this? Marsha. Yes, one is an act of God. So the question was, it's a good question. One is, um, let me start with the, with the last one. Why is there a difficulty with thinking about the Nephilim when we have the incarnation here? I think the prime difference is this is an act of Almighty God. The other is an act of created being. So angels aren't divine, they are created. They are of a higher plane of creation, being pure intellect and pure spirit if we hold that they're all non-corporeal, um, so they don't have infinite power to do those sorts of things. Well, because I think we, we speculate based on what Scripture says, and we speculate based on the limits of knowledge of what, of what they do and what they don't do. And so how angels are purely messengers communicating the will of God and the revelation of God and they're, the only time we see them doing things on their own is when they're tempting, right? Um, but there's certainly this idea of, of limited knowledge. And, that's, and this is another whole other um, lecture where one of the theories of atonement, one of the, by theory of atonement means understanding what actually happened on the cross is that the devil was tricked by thinking he could put to death Jesus Christ as a sinful man, but was deceived because Jesus Christ is sinless, and so therefore the whole game was up, and the, 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 the dominion that Satan had on earth is now avoided because he put to death a, a sinless person. So even in those theories, there is a very clear understanding that there is limited knowledge in, in, in the angelic beings. The point is, we're all making educated, prayerful guesses. And, that needs to, and even the great, like Thomas Aquinas and other people would always say, these are prayerful reflections, and these are opinions. And we need, we need to be careful. Everything I've just said tonight is my opinion and other opinions, because we don't know. And anyone who has any other knowledge than that is lying to you or is just deluded. We have no idea how these things work. We have no idea the substance of an angel. But based on prayerful reflection and tradition and scripture and all these things, we come up with, with the best way that we can articulate it. Um, and the, um, the question about Jesus Christ dying on the cross and can other worlds have their own Bible? Oh, absolutely. I think you see Jesus Christ in different ways, not, please hear me, I'm not saying reincarnation at all, but you see the figure of Christ in various modes or forms in Scripture. Let me give you a couple examples. Melchizedek is really kind of a Christ-like figure in the book of Genesis. The fourth person in the, in the furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who was their salvation? You have these foreshadowings. You have these images of one like the Son of Man in these places. And so for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that was you know, a salvific moment. For Abram offering the tithes of bread and wine um, to Melchizedek, or Melchizedek had the bread and wine, a Eucharistic sign, is a, is a Christ um, sort of theophany, a manifestation there. So th does that mean that this one event once offered has its, how it's communicated, I love how um, 
Sinistrari says, is a secret between God and them. Who knows? It's interesting to think about, though. Anything else? So stay tuned to what the news says, right? But I hope the main takeaway is there's no theological reason why whatever is revealed, if they come back and say, sorry to keep you waiting, there's no evidence of anything at all, we're all here by ourselves, or if they have a press conference and President Biden says, yo, I ain't gonna believe this, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we're grateful for this vast creation which displays your creative power, which gives us a glimpse of the beauty of your love. Help us to be confident in your love for us and for the salvation given to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, who for us and for our salvation lived, died, rose, ascended, and promises to return, to bring us to that beatific vision where we may see you as you are in the fullness of your nature and glory and wisdom. Through the same Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.